I appreciate it. All I always right. leave a 30 minute cushion on the back end of these things. Cause you never know. I hear you. Now I got to actually, I got to drive up to the woodlands today. I've got a meeting with Repsol. Um, so good I don't want to, and it's, it's a sales call. I don't want to be late for that. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, well, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, welcome to this week's episode. I'm here in Zoom land with Mark Rossano, founder and CEO at C6 Capital Holdings and host of Primary Vision Network. Mark, welcome. I'm going to say back to the show, but welcome to, to Wicked Energy with JG. How are you doing today? Well, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I, I know that uh, since the last time we spoke, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket. I don't, I don't even know what to consider it anymore. So the, I think there's the, definitely going to be some stuff to talk about. Yeah, no, it is. And and for the listeners, like I kind of mentioned, this is the second time I've had Mark on the podcast. Uh, the last time I had you on was uh, for my former podcast, which is OG uh, from OGGN called Oil and Gas on Shore. And, and for those out there, uh, I encourage everyone to go back because it's a great way to get to know the man behind Primary Vision and C6 Capital. And so I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, so to, to kick things off, and, and we'll get into the market stuff, but if I recall, you really enjoy family movie night. And so, you know, since then, there's been quite a bit of movies that have come out. Are there any new movies that, that you've been able to enjoy with the family and any good recommendations? So my, my family is a uh, huge into zombies, the Disney plus the musical ones. So ah. uh, uh, zombie three, uh, zombie three came out. So that was a thing. <laughs> okay. uh, so I've already been told that I'm going to resurrect my uh, Halloween costume as Zed. So I will be Zed coming again, October 31st. If you'd like to see the original costume, I do have those pictures. <laughs> So that was good. And then they've gotten into the musical that is now on Netflix called 13. And it's about a boy who uh, who's with uh, in a family that was divorced and, and they uh, they move back to uh, to their mom's hometown. So that is another one. I have three girls. So musicals dancing is, is right at the level. So that those are the two that I think have been the best that we've seen. And then uh, and then they were actually coming home this week and we're going to watch Lucky because I always joke that I have no luck. And so, uh, so they, they're very excited to see that as well. Nice. No, I love that. And we had, uh, my daughter, still, she's only six. And so she's still, uh, she, she's at the age where she loves to, you know, repeat, watch multiple movies. And yeah. so if it's not frozen, it's little mermaid. And so, uh, this weekend we had little mermaid in the media room going again for about the 18,000th time, which is okay. She it's loves okay. it. Yeah. She loves it every time. Uh, and so my son, he got bored of that. So he wanted to go watch, uh, you know, monster trucks on his iPad during movie time. So, um, yeah, we, we had to kind of do a little bit of an audible with him, but we made right. it work. So, so um, Fro frozen one or two, which is your favorite? Uh, I, I, I like the originals. I'm always, I'm, okay. I'm such an okay. original guy now, granted that the, the quality and everything else is frozen two is good. Um, but I, I got to go back to the original. I love the original. <laughs> I, I, that's fair. I'm, I'm, I'm a frozen two fan personally. I, I, okay. I do like, I do like the updated one. And yeah. then, uh, and the, the kids tried to watch Buzz Lightyear, but it was a bit above them, but they do love Bluey, which has the new season oh, out now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Bluey's, Bluey's good. So, uh, yeah. So the, so the episode that we recorded originally, it got released on March 15th of, of this year. Um, and, and without looking, do you remember where WTI and Henry Hub were around that time? Uh, I, were they actually, no, they were probably so March. So that was after the invasion. So they were at what? One Oh, one Oh five, one Oh six. And then Henry hub was what it's six fifty seven. So you're a little high, but pretty damn close at, so WTI closed that day at 96 42. And okay. then even more exciting, you know, with natural gas, uh, it was only at four forty six. And so, Man. yeah, until today we're sitting, you know, again, at the time right now, looking at, uh, we're 89 92 for WTI and at 960, well, about 970 for, yeah. for Henry hub. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a whirlwind. Um, and, and so, I mean, how would you say kind of the, the from going from out of last winter uh, up until now, did you, did you suspect the way summer would go? I mean, did everything kind of fall in line with what you thought, or was there anything that really surprised you over the summer? So I think the thing that surprised me the most was how, uh, was, was really how oil, oil really managed. Like it had its upward momentum. Uh, Anas had asked for some comments. You know, my view is that Brent kind of settles for the second half of the year at about 102, 103. So I kind of think we're in this, this weird conundrum right now. 
where you're going to get this, this, some really high pricing based on uh, what has the highest distillate cut. So like when you look at some of the spreads in the market, you know, there's some things that are 14 bucks above uh, dated Brent. But when you look at it, it's because they have a really high diesel cut. So I think you're just going to see this bifurcation in the physical market where things that don't have high D, uh, DISTI is going to trade at a discount. Things that do is going to trade at a premium. Uh, the other thing that I would say shocked me the most is Saudi Arabia with their um, official selling prices. Mm. You know, they have definitely gunned things, which I thought was very interesting, especially when you start looking at their, their floating storage. Floating storage has gone, it's approaching where we were in 2016, which was the elevated level after the, they started the, uh, the price war. So I, I think that was the most surprising. I, I think the thing that was the least shocking was natural gas because, excuse me, as we saw things progressing within Russia, within the Europe, I think people were underestimating how bad that was going to be for natural gas flows, for storage. And, and, I, I, and then at the same time, people panic. And how much of what has happened right now in Europe is panic, how much of it is, is real. And I think there's kind of a mixture of both, but all of that is just going to lead to a very healthy Henry Hub uh, price. Yeah, no, this, this, and again, we'll get into to what we think winner's going to do, but um, yeah, I, I think, you know, personally, again, looking, I, I don't dive into the details quite, quite as much as yourself, um, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, my career lives and dies by rig count. Um, and so rig count's always a, an interesting conversation. Um, and, and so what I'd like to, to kind of, for the folks who, who aren't maybe familiar is, is a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Um, actually, Mark does a phenomenal job. If you go on YouTube and you look at primary vision network, uh, you do one almost, is it almost every day, Mark, or, or why don't you lay out the schedule? Cause it's like every Monday is this, every Tuesday yeah. is that. And it's a very nice cadence of information coming every, pretty much every week. So we, tr we try to keep it consistent. So Wednesday is the EIA show. So we look at what is happening on oil refined products in the U S and global. So segment one is, is what happened two weeks ago. Segment two is about what's happening in the U S segment three is global oil, physical market, international uh, refined products. Uh, Thursday is a macro macro economy and geopolitical show. And then Friday is a, the, the primary vision frack spread count. And then just kind of like a wrap up of where are rigs, where are they going, where's spread counts, where are they going? And then some interesting data that might have come out that we think is going to be uh, that should be considered going into the weekend. Yeah. So so now and, and again, I want to keep on this sort of the YouTube and then the, and the content creation piece of it for a sec. Uh, are you enjoying that? And, and if so, like what what is the intent and, and why do you do it? Because I find it's. Very interesting. I've seen over since 2020, even till now, a lot of a lot of companies, a lot of individuals are, are creating content, whether it's through Twitter, whether it's, you know, YouTube channels, um, you know, there's just a there, there's a lot of different oops, there's a lot of different folks coming out and, and continuously updating, uh, you know, at, at no cost. I mean, for you for for to be able to get the information that you do in such an organized fashion, um, people would pay money for it. So I'm curious, like, what what is the why for, for doing what you do with primary vision? Sure. So there, there's multi, uh, multi-fold. So one, I wanted to do this since 2016. I, I, I thought that there was a lack of understanding of all the data that comes out and how rich all of the data is around the world. And, and I thought that mainstream media was, was kind of falling down and it, and it really kind of accelerated. I, I think the cracking started around 2012, 2013, where there, nobody was giving you, here's the data, here's what it means, and here's my opinion. And so uh, in 2020, I thought it would be a good marketing uh, move for the fund because we're in the process of still fundraising to buy hydroelectric assets, uh, you know, address the food shortage and the diesel shortage. So I thought it would be a good way to kind of capture my thoughts and, and really create a, a bit of a track record. But at the same time, I think that there's people want information and people want unbiased information. And I try my hardest to, to so that you'll watch these shows and never know if I'm a Democrat or a Republican, completely agnostic, like this is the data, this is what the data means, this is what it means going forward. And, and I just wanted to try to pull back because I, I feel like everyone has an agenda and I mm. didn't want to have an agenda. I wanted to just show it yeah, naked, like, and if you don't agree with me, that's great. 
here's my information. And, and, I, and I think right now the biggest issue is everyone has an agenda and then they skew the data. So yeah. it's like, look, this is, the, this is everything. I'm going to show you the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. And then you know how I think it's going to play out over the uh, coming few quarters. Yeah, no, it's great. And that's what I, I can appreciate about it because anytime you see data, whether it's coming through whatever platform or whatever media, it's everyone, again, and, and, and understandably so, is, is, is people put a spin on it, put their opinion on it. And, and, but for the most part, like you said, like you, you present the data, you sort of synthesize it and, and you say, you know, based off the trends here, where's where things could possibly go. And, and then it's up to the consumer to draw their own conclusions as well, which again, I, I really admire. And it's hard to find <laughs> folks uh, putting out content with, without that spin uh, and, and then trying to push, push stuff. So it can certainly, uh, I, I respect that. Um, I appreciate that. You, I mean, we, it's with, I think three and a half hours of, of content. And the thing is I'm doing it anyway. So it was right. like, I'm already organizing all of this. So is there a way to capitalize on it? And that was what kind of was the impetus of putting it on YouTube and uh, yeah. on the podcast form. Yeah, no, that's great. And so I remember, and you kind of briefly mentioned about the hydroelectricity. When we spoke back in March, you were, you guys were kind of looking to, for, you know, pursue some initiatives on that front. Um, any updates on that or anything exciting yeah. that you can share? Yeah, so it, it's uh, it's very exciting. So we, we we do we bought our first uh, group of them in February. They've uh, they've done fantastic. Obviously, with electricity prices going where they are, uh, we just put a binding final bid on another twenty two assets. Uh, so that were the in in the running for that. I, I did a due diligence tour of twelve of the twenty two, and we're in the process of finalizing another three offers for areas both within New Hampshire and New York. So there's, wow. there's a lot of, of, uh, of opportunity out there. You know, it, it's, it just in, in terms of what we're looking to do to increase value, you know, we've looked at uh, hydrogen and it's interesting because we're not doing hydrogen because it's in the political lexicon. You know, there's a, there's a net shortage in, in, in the industrial sector, especially in the Midwest. Uh, we're looking at data centers as a way to uh, increase returns because some of the tier two and tier three markets, they just don't have the computing power. And there's some interesting opportunities within that on the micro side to use some of the power and, uh, and, and, and kind of divvy it up a little bit differently. Interesting. No, that's, uh, that's exciting. And so, you know, with, with, uh, I guess, well, this kind of leads into another question, but you know, I'm I'm sure you're very well aware. You know, the whole Inf uh, Inflation Reduction Act that um, you know that was passed, and and everyone's all excited about that in many different ways. Um, but you know, for people like you in the consulting, PE, and business strategy space, um, can you give just like a general overview of like is that something that's going to help help or um, I mean, did, did, how does that impact you and and moving forward with some of the initiatives that you have? Is it does it make a big difference or sure? So it, it does because we will be creating what is deemed green hydrogen. So there is a, a benefit and a payout and there's a sliding scale on, on carbon footprint and what the type of payments you can get. So it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag in terms of good and bad, which I, I think most of these are. You know, Obviously you get the MVP, the Mountain Valley Pass uh, push through, which is about two BCF a day. That'll help alleviate some near-term shortfalls. But again, if you look at Golden Pass being built, Port Arthur being built, Freeport coming back, it's just it's just going to be a drop in the bucket. It did outline the path for FERC and for EPA regulation, which I think was missing. So it should actually speed up the uh, approval process, which is a positive. But there is a, a lot of pork for the green initiatives, which I, I think have already shown the issues in terms of energy storage, energy density. You know, what does that mean for BTU value? What does that mean for capacity? So, and then it obviously raises taxes. So when you think about the tax increase, but it, the way they're doing it, I, I think, is in, in a better uh, structure. The, the problem is, and this is where we, we, we sit right now, is we've been easing for so long since 2008 with any, without any real tightening. So now we're heading into a recession or in a recession, depending on what metrics you want to use. And we're raising taxes. We're raising rates. So I, I think there's going to be a little bit of a, a struggle on that. 
but net net, it's not going to be an inflation reduction act. That's a lie. I don't really <laughs> think it's going to be all that inflationary either. I think it's kind of a non-event when you consider what it, what it's doing in terms of how it's going through, uh, you know, because it is going to be inflationary because it is spending, right. but at the same time, it's also raising taxes, which is deflationary. So it, it kind of goes both ways in terms of balancing it out in, in general. Yeah. So kind of a, a comical question, but I'm genuinely curious. Why do you think they named it the Infl Inflation Reduction Act? I've been trying <laughs> to scratch my head on that forever. Is it like a, is it a marketing thing or like yeah. what? Yeah. yeah. So okay. uh, one, one, a buddy of mine, Matthew Water, he does a lot with, uh, with Google Trends and what are the things happening. Uh, and if you do inflation and recession are like the number one and two, and they go back and forth. They're like, you know, some days you'll look and it's like, that's the number one trending thing. So if you look at the inflation reduction act, it just screams everything that is, is happening in the world. I think it's the number inflation has been like the number one trending thing. Uh, if you look at small businesses, it's the number, like the survey, it's the number one thing small businesses are talking about. So by calling it the Inflation Reduction Act, it just it catches eyeballs, and it, and and again, it, it's it's a game. Like I don't know if you remember back in uh, I, I think it was 2010, uh, 2010 or eleven, there was the Affordable Care Act and then the Obamacare Act. Yeah. And and they they kept going back and forth where they they would ask people on the street like, what do you think about Obamacare? And they're like, oh, it's terrible. It's the worst thing in the world. And then they're like, well, what do you think about the um, the Affordable Care Act. Oh, it's great. You know, this is what the world needs. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's just marketing. <laughs> and so right. I, I think it became marketing for to get this through and to get people uh, pumped up about it. I can see that. I, I mean, it's, it's definitely piqued my interest and, in, you know, being in the oil and gas space and, you know, trying to see how it'll impact, um, you know, you know, us and, and what we do is I, I mean, trying to there's a bunch of people who've put good summaries out there. And so I'm still trying to dissect it just, just for my own knowledge and, and to understand kind of, you know, path forward and, and maybe capture some opportunity. Um, but I do want to pivot a little bit here uh, and, and talk more on a macro level is, you know, for, for you, what do you suspect is going to be the biggest challenge uh, in the entire energy landscape as we move into winter? I mean, obviously natural gas prices, that's going to, it's going to be huge, but, but more domestically here, let um, a lot of the listeners here in the U S obviously, including ourselves. So I'm, I'm curious for the U S I mean, are, anything that you kind of think of as, as we go into winter? Sure. Yeah. I, I think as we, as we prepare for winter, I think we're going to be facing a, a big hit on three different levels. One is going to be electricity pricing. I think electricity prices are going to continue to shift higher depending on where you are in the country, you're pricing off of LNG, natural gas, or thermal coal. And when you look at all three of those things, they're at, at you know, his, not historic highs, but at least in the last decade, they've been at the, you know, this is the highest they've been. And, and I think that that's going to be a big shock because I, I, you know, when you look at gasoline prices, everyone's like, oh, gasoline prices are going down. That's great. It's a benefit to the people, but it's like, all right, well, what, it, what is your electricity bill doing? You know, what is your, you know, what are the goods that you're purchasing that re require electricity? I think that's going to be a big shock. Uh, the other one's going to be diesel. So when you look at heating oil, so heating oil, road diesel are essentially the same thing at this point, you know, molecularly speaking, they actually dye one a different color, just so you know, which is which, uh, yeah. and, and that is becoming a huge problem because there is a, a global shortfall of diesel. But more importantly, there's a big shortfall on the East Coast. And if you look at who consumes the most heating oil, it's the Northeast. And that's where we're actually the shortest. And I think that's going to become a much bigger overhang in general. So those are the two. And then the last one, I think, is on the propane um, <coughs> NGL chem side. So one of the things when you look at pet chem, I think that there is a, a big problem in demand. And the reason why I say that is on the housing front. So when you look at housing, you, you've gotten a, a big shortfall that has that was persistent, and now the supply chain is catching up very quickly. And the remodelers, there's a great chart out from some of the consulting firms that talk about how the remodeling side, which is kind of like the last you know, strength, if you will, uh, they have about 5.1 months of backlog, and then it drops off in a big way. So I think you're starting to see the cracks 
on the housing front, which is going to hit pen, pet chem, which is going to be a, a slight benefit for the consumer because propane should be uh, come a little bit cheaper than what it has been. But the export market remains so robust that you're going to kind of flatline a bit. So I think it's going to be uh, you know, propane. It should get a little bit more adoption, I think. I think you're going to see LPG in general uh, become a bit more. And I'd like to see it increase adoption internally because I think it's a, it's a very flexible molecule. It's one that can be moved fairly quickly. But I, I think the pet chem world is coming into a lot of, uh, a lot of pain. Hmm. No, that, I mean, that's again, kind of, kind of out of the realm, but I mean, how do we overcome it or, or what can, I mean, is this going to be ongoing you think, or wh where do you see us then coming out of the winter? Uh, so I, I think that coming out of winter, there's going to be a lot of pain. I, I think natural gas is going to obviously be volatile, but I, I think it's just going to stay at a very elevated price, just given we were, uh, we're even with Freeport being down, we're exporting 5.5, 6 MTPA. That's going to continue. There's, there's a huge market externally in terms of where it is, but there's also a huge market internally. And because of the delays in pipelines, because of the, uh, the, the fairly, you know, I'll, I'll call it muted storage situation, you're going to see prices that are going to stay strong, but it hits everything because it hits your electricity price. It hits um, the, the goods that you're purchasing. It's going to hurt them because all of those companies, their costs are going up. It's going to hit. Uh, and then it's just, it's, it's going to hit you just heating your home in general, if you're using natural gas. So there's, it, it just, it has so many ramifications. And one of the, the biggest issues when you look at industrial growth and, and economic growth, every time we've had a huge surge in economic expansion, it's on the back of cheap energy. It's on the back of cheap electricity. And we're coming into a period where that is now gone. And I don't, I don't think I, it can come back. I don't think it, it has to go away forever, but I think we have to be realistic on what does base load look like? What does, what does electricity generation look like? What kind of capacity do we need? And, and I think if we can have a real situation, uh, a real conversation about it, where does nuke fit in? Where does the SMR, the small modular reactors fit? I think then you can, we can start to actually come up with solutions the problem is it takes time. And, and after mismanaging the grid for 40 plus years, now we're, we're it's going to take you know a decade, you know 15 years to really start to get us back to where we need to be. And I think Europe is going to be a, a big overhang within that. And then as you kind of mix all of that in, you have the, the, the prevailing food shortage. You have an issue like China just issued a, uh, it's, not, it's top warning for food security. Because, and for those that have been following the, the YouTube show in 2020, I was talking about the, you know, the Yangtze river and the three gorges dam and how it's moving and 800 year flood. Now they have the complete opposite and they have this massive drought that is, that is, is, is being, you know, just as impactful in terms of what it, what did in terms of the food supply. And that's this other little thing that is working beneath it. And, and the reason why that's concerning is when you look at the 1930s, not to say that we're going to see a depression, but everyone thinks about the Great Depression, but everyone forgets the Dust Bowl. And everyone forgets the issue that we had with food and how that really compounded the problems. And there's a lot of that happening right now with just multifaceted problems that are hitting uh, you know, humanity at the same time. Yeah, no, it's true. Uh, so if we if you look at, um, say, US production, um, and there's a few categories that I kind of like to lump into into what makes up US production, you have, you know, rig count, frax bed count, and of, mm -hmm. co of course, ducks. Um, right now, we're sitting at roughly around 12, one, 12, two, kind of bouncing around much to do much of that's being held up a little bit or considerably by our strategic petroleum reserve, which we've been draining uh, pretty mm -hmm. heavily. Um, but kind of backing up onto the rig count side of things, or say rig count, frac spread count, um, how, how do you see those shaping up for the, throughout the winter? So I, I think that we're going to get, you know, the rig count and, and the, why we always break it down into the specifics because the horizontal side has been very strong. Even mm -hmm. when you've had the rig count on the headline number going down, 
you've still seen horizontals continue to go higher. So our view was that we were, as we got to the end of summer, you were going to see a flat line and actually I start to see increasing in duck counts. Cause I think you're going to get one more push. I actually thought it was going to happen at the beginning of August. Instead it's, it's, I, we, you know, based on talking to our CTO, it's starting this, this week. And you're going to start to see a bit of an increase on the, on the uh, frac spread count, but it, within reason. And the problem is just the, the availability of equipment, the availability of labor, you know, the, the different pieces that come into it. So even though we're going to get an increase in the, in the, in the uh, frac spread count, we're only getting to 300, maybe 305. You know, the realistic peak that I had was 315 with a market at 325. But it's important to understand that that, that delta between the two, that, that's not high quality stuff. Like that's stuff that's coming back that's doing shallower wells, a little less horsepower, a, a bit older. And that's really what we're going to see pushing through as we go through September and October, because I think you're going to get that, that bump that's going to really get us to an exit rate between 12.2, 12.3 million barrels a day. I don't really see a huge surge to 12.4, 12.5. You know, I, I think next year we could get to about 12.7 million, 12.9 million on the exit rate. But then I, I think the U.S. is is pretty tapped out. I, I don't I don't see us with this huge surge in, in production. I think we're coming into kind of a steady state of what can be maintained through ducks, through new completions, and then what is becoming what we think is a newer opportunity on the refract side. And obviously, yeah. refracts have been around forever. It's just just like everything else. So is fracking, but we kept getting better at it. And I think refracts were getting better at it. And if you just think about what it yields on a bit more of a liquid base, a bit more of a natural gas base in the past, that was a detriment because you didn't want natural gas. Like it was like a waste product that yeah. how do I get rid of this? And now you're like, how do I get natural gas? How do I, how do I increase my, my natural gas throughput? And I think that that has opened up some additional opportunities, which, but again, you're looking at just maintaining production not really the big surge. So I do think we get some additional horizontals coming on. And I do think we peak at about 305, 310 spreads as we get uh, through, uh, you know, really through October. And then we get our normal seasonal drop off that happens between, you know, beginning of November that accelerates from Thanksgiving into year end. Right. No, that the, the rig count again, being on the oil field service side, uh, you know, we, we watch rig count closely and just talking closely with a lot of the drilling contractors. Um, they're not real fond of using a bunch of CapEx to, to bring out more iron. Um, you know, it sounds, seems like the focus is more on increasing day rates so that they can afford to hire people with better salaries and, and reinvest into, you know, their technology, not necessarily deploy more rigs. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's tough. And even on the fracks, I have a good friend who owns a, a frack company and uh, the, the investor sentiment is like, how, how, you know, is, are we going to dump a bunch of money back into oil and gas and, you know, ramp up production? Well, I don't know. Investors seem to be pretty happy right now with, with actually getting, uh, you know, some returns <laughs> back, uh, which yeah. we hadn't seen, you know, especially since the shale revolution, um, which is, you know, again, just a, a great and amazing story in itself. Uh, but, without so i'm curious and i don't know if you've looked at the numbers or have a, just a guess but assuming we actually tried to build back our spr how many frac spreads or how many you know what do the numbers look like what to say let's just say to maintain like a 12-2 uh on the production side how many you know with accounting for decline rates and everything else how many rig or frac spreads or rigs would we need to get to, to, to maintain that production rate? Do you have any like wild guess or, or yeah, is that so, tough to figure out? So we, we had it uh, back in, when we were looking at the uh, spreads, but this was, uh, you know, coming back to the 11.5 realm was you needed about 150 to 165 spreads to maintain that. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we're, we're back up and, and that's where I think we're getting to that, that precipice of, where we can sit at about 12.5 and see this level of activity. And I think this level of activity would be enough to keep us at about a 12.5 uh, million barrels per day at oh. this point. I don't, I, I don't think 
if we go up and, and again, within that there's dual frack, there's simul frack, which is be, which is increasing in adoption depending on nomenclature and that will make things more efficient. But I, I think we're coming into kind of a steady state that to your point that people want to see, you know, one of the benefits that's coming into the market, coming back to housing and pet chem, when you look at pipe and as you talked about iron, there's that, there's that competition between what goes into the housing market and what goes into the energy market. And the difference between the pipe is uh, the energy market is threaded and the, what goes into the retail, uh, into the real estate market isn't threaded. That's the only difference. So when you look at 2020, you had a ton of pipe guys that were sitting with, with inventory of both. But then all of a sudden the housing market exploded and the energy market continued to lack anything. So now they, they sold all of their pipe and they had all of this spare capacity that they couldn't sell into the market because it was threaded. And now you, you've seen them get a bit smarter in the sense of they're like, look, I am not holding inventory if you guys on the energy side want to have pipe, you have to reserve your spot and then I'll thread it. And, and I think as you get housing coming down, you'll get a little bit better economics, not to say that it's going to increase exponentially because it's at exponential pricing. So even a pullback of 20%, you're still at multi you know, five, seven, eight year highs. It's just, I think you're going to see some of the price come down, which will help the economics and that'll okay. help support keep things and again keeping them here I, and and i and i that's why i'm comfortable in saying that 12.5 12.7 million barrels a day i think is a very comfortable place for the us to live in when you're looking at what we can produce on a going basis when you talk about spr you know there's a certain amount of the spr sales that were lent where they they're going to come back to us uh, with with premium but you also have to look at what was making up the SPR. And, and if you consider the amount of light sweet we have in the ground, the amount we can get out, you know, we really need to reconfigure what the SPR holds. And, and, and I think we really need to consider bringing back more medium, more heavy, because that's what we're missing. You know, we're, we're never going to build a keystone to bring uh, more oil sands down into the U.S. So we need to adjust for how do we process crude and the average api in the us is between 33 and 34 and the shale the shale is throwing out 42 to 48 so we need that heavier piece that we're missing to really bring that that down so i think that's going to be the 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 shift and i think that could easily come from nigeria you could get more from iraq it's just going to be a matter of timing and i think that would be a the best way to reconfigure uh, the way we're set up going forward. Interesting. No, I, I yeah, I've, I've not heard quite that in detail, but that that does make sense. Uh, throughout the the pandemic, there was a, a challenge for us in the, in the energy space or the, in the oil and gas space. Is there was a lot of underinvestment. Um, is that still playing out? And is the investor sentiment coming around, or do you still think we're going to have to kind of fund this thing ourselves? So it's funny. Uh, so unfortunately, I think we're still going to have to uh, do it ourselves. But when when investors miss out and lose money being in something and then miss out, on, I think you get a, a, a shift in the sentiment. And and if you and this is the, the fun thing about politics, is it's and the, go again to your point on calling it the Inflation Reduction Act. If you look they've stopped calling natural gas a bridge fuel. And it, it, it was, and it's interesting because if you go back through the, uh, you know, 2019 and beyond, natural gas was always a bridge fuel. You know, oil was evil, but natural gas was a bridge fuel. Now they've gotten rid of the term bridge fuel and it's just natural gas. I, I think they're too far down the rabbit hole to back out on considering oil evil. But I think there's this acceptance that natural gas and by that way, propane and beyond, that they're going to be very important. And, and I do think that there is a, a, a little mini boom that's going to come back. And I think you're going to get some of that investment and it's going to be pairing between, OK, well, I have to I'm a bank that has to show a balanced approach. So I will invest in oil and natural gas, but I'm going to need an offset. And, and I think as you get more of those offsets, you're going to have a bit more of this rejiggering of 
money that can be filtered down because there will be that backdrop. We're also in the process of working with companies to capture flare gas, capture flu gas. And I think that we're so far showing the opportunities because again, carbon capture is great, but why am I capturing it and leaving it in the ground? Like there's a market for carbon. Food grade carbon has a market. So how about I capture this carbon? How about I capture all of these things? And then I turn it into products people need. Look at fertilizer, you look at carbon, you look at hydrogen, you know, and again, like I'm not talking about hydrogen in the political nomenclature, Uh, you know, a refiner needs hydrogen to crack the oil molecules. So some of it, they make themselves, some of it, they, they filter in through, uh, through imports. So there's a way to, to balance this. And I think that if we continue to see this, there's a way to be green without being egregious. Mm. And, and I, I think if you start to marry that in, you're going to get a big adoption to it and you're going to see more money pivot. I think electric, you know, EFRAX, how much does that start to, to play in? Can we show some of this, you know, renewable diesel, not biodiesel, biodiesel has its own issues, but renewable diesel, you know, molecularly, molecularly the same, you know, you don't have the water separation. You don't have to worry about where excess wear and tear. So all of a sudden, if you can start running that, you know, what does your, what does your score look like? And I think you can all of a sudden start to see this adoption. And, and I, I think people are starting to recognize the failures of wind, the, the shortfalls of solar, you know, there's, there's a lot of CO2 that goes into it. There's a lot of other things that are actually worse than CO2 going into the atmosphere if you look at the build out of wind and solar, where you can manage that with sensors and whatnot, when you're looking at methane and, uh, and NGLs as they move through the system. Interesting. So kind of going backing up to, to natural gas, uh, you know, obviously abroad, there's been challenges on, on a number of different fronts, especially since the invasion of Ukraine, but how does the U S fit into the future of, of global gas markets? So one of the things that that I was the most excited about, and when I worked with uh, different government agencies uh, back when I'm in my Bloomberg days, I was trying to get the Europeans to accept the fact that they needed regas capacity because you can't trust Russia. I mean, they turned off the, the gas in 2009, 2012. They threatened it multiple times in between that. They, mul- they threatened it multiple times after that, especially when uh, the Trump administration put sanctions on Nord Stream 2. So you you have to look at a diversified scope, but most like politicians in general, they looked at the curve and they said, oh, TTF is telling us that you know gas is going away, green is working. And it's like, no, the curve is telling you that right now we're oversupplied and it's factoring that in going forward in terms of a cut in investment. I was like, that curve can change tomorrow. That there's no, that's that's not predictive. And and I think now when you look at the pivot, the, and the reason why I bring that up is because I wanted them to sign up contracts with the US to ensure that we had the investment that we needed back in 27, 2018, because I actually thought there was going to be a shortfall in natural gas LNG as we came into the 2022 into 2024, 2025, I do have supporting documents. I'm not saying that because there actually is one. I, 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 I did say it, it exists. <laughs> but now that you come to this point and you get this, this uh, egregious situation in terms of these huge pivots in the market, now you're getting this where, okay, they, some of these facilities finally got the investment they needed, but now we're behind the eight ball. And you're not going to get these things coming online for another two to three years, which is going to create a big shortfall in the global markets. Now, Russia is pivoting. They're sending more gas to China by pipe, which is going to diminish the amount that China wants or needs to buy on an LNG front, which will then open up some more movements into other uh, markets. But it's still there's still a broad shortfall. There's still this need for, for natural gas because coal was retrofitted. You know, they got rid of coal, they put in natural gas. And, and now you have this beholden factor. So then you look at it and say, okay, well, the emerging markets or this, you know, Central Asia to, to pick on Central Asia for a moment, you know, LNG is too expensive. So what do they go? They, well, let's buy low sulfur diesel. 
oh my God, low sulfur diesel, super expensive. And then you go to the high sulfur. So that's when I, I look at the green game and you want to say, look, if you really want to make an impact here, we need to ensure that there's enough natural gas to increase the adoption, to increase, to decrease the cost, because then you're going to take down coal, then you're going to take down diesel, then you're going to take down high sulfur fuel oil. And that's how you're going to make a big sweeping adjustment. There's a lot of what used to be stranded gas that I think is now deeply in the money. You could start to bring that, that on board. And I think that with the new modular structures, that we were in a great position to bring natural gas to the world and really create, I, I think, the green dream that everyone's been talking about, but riding it on the back of natural gas, not something that, I, that doesn't have the density or the BTU value to carry the, uh, the workload. Yeah, no, that, that's a, a fascinating way to put it. And, and I just wonder, I mean, so because we talk about kind of being able to ha have some foresight or, or a line of sight of, of where we can get to on, on an oil production uh, standpoint here in the US. What does that look like on the natural gas? I mean, do you think, um, you know, we're at a point where we've reached like kind of mass capacity on the supply side for natural gas? I mean, obviously, we're with regards to exporting, we're, we're you know, there's only a certain amount of capacity that we have. And I know people are building and, and trying to deploy LNG facilities. Um, but I mean, I guess the question is like, where do you see us getting to a point on, on natural gas production? Are we close? Do we have a long way to go? Kind of what's your thoughts on, on that? I, I think we're pipe restricted and, and that's why Mountain Valley Pass is, is nice, but again, short, like we still need more. Mm. And, and I think we, we start, we need to get really serious on how are we going to build out the natural gas components? You know, is there a way the Haynesville is going to be very active? There's a lot of spare pipe there. I, I think you're going to see the Anandarko get a bit more love, which there's a lot of spare pipe there. But when you start to look at the Marcellus, and, and I know that there's been pushback back and forth on the Marcellus isn't as big as we assumed it was, you know, there's going to be issues on the production side, but we still have a pipe constraint. We still have to, to help de bottleneck. And, and I think that as you get prices, obviously sitting at over nine, nine fifty, there's a lot of acreage that's, that's in the money right now that was not in the money at two fifty or even three bucks. So I, I think we, we need to, to, look at this strategically of, okay, well, where do we need this gas processing? You know, one of the uh, companies that were invested in Sultec, they, they take, uh, they process, they take the sulfur and turn it into organic uh, fertilizer. So they turn it into micronized elemental sulfur, but that's great. And we're answering the call on one of the sides, but we're helping to, to, uh, to desulfurize this acid gas, the sour gas, so the goal is that's also going to bring up because a lot of this gas was getting pumped down back down into a well to be forgotten forever because there was no way to on an economic level to desulfurize it and now with this solution this will also de bottleneck this will also open up some additional capacity especially coming out of Wyoming where there's a, a lot of uh, sulfuric gas when you look at the Middle East there's a lot of high sulfur gas that that can be processed and I think you're going to start to see that kind of rejiggering. And when you look at the, the Middle East and the commentary right now from, from Saudi Arabia, I, I think you're also going to see a, an increase in adoption of natural gas within the region. And then that you're going to get additional exports, not to say that you're going to see oil production change, but it's just going to be how much is consumed internally, how much of it is exported. And that's going to be on the back of additional natural gas investment. And I think that we're, where, you know, as I always joke, Americans are great at arbitrage and inventing things. <laughs> and I, I think that holds true. I, I think we see the problem. We're going to invent a way to address it, and then we're going to arbitrage it away. And I think that is we're, we're in this very interesting period of conversion. But the benefit is we're doing it with the idea that, okay, well, we have to meet a new green standard. And I'm going to meet this standard, and I'm not going to need those subsidies. The subsidies will be great. They'll pad my returns. But as I learned taking enough ethanol facilities into and out of bankruptcy and into receivership, you can never, ever invest in something that is driven by government subsidies because the stroke of a pen and they're gone. You know, you want to get into something that can stand alone, stand on its own two feet, 
maybe pad the returns from from the uh, government, but they can't drive the returns. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're starting to see that at this point with some of the subsidies starting to run out where I think investors, especially as rates go up, people have to be a bit more prudent with their dollars. You're going to see a, a shift from, okay, well, the venture capital thing was great, but I need returns quickly. Where are things on expansion? And, and I think that it's a very good point in time to be raising money, which sh sounds shocking when I say it, but in that pre round and round A component, because those are things that are ready for commercial. They're ready for the big show. And a lot of them are answering the call of increasing natural gas production, increasing oil production, but doing it under a green scope. And I think that's where it gets very interesting where the two worlds converge because I mean, you're down in Texas, you know, like people down there are very creative and it's like, oh, so you wanna, you wanna put a new hindrance to me? Okay, I'll figure it out. And then they figure it out. And, and now there's a new shift and a new drive. And I think it's uh, going to be a very interesting decade, to say the least. No kidding. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, oftentimes people say it's going to be chaotic. People, you know, a lot of fear mongering. But at the end of the day, I, I'm optimistic. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of innovation happening. And, and ultimately, just for energy in general. I mean, you can't argue the fact that uh, energy demand is going to continue to increase. Hopefully, economic growth continues to to, to be present. And, um, you know, folks like yourself will continue to, to capture the upside. And so, uh, we've touched on a lot of topics today. I, for the <laughs> listeners are probably like, Holy smokes, but clearly you can tell Mark keeps his finger on the pulse of just about everything. Uh, it, there's no, you know, there's no question unanswered, which is amazing. And so I encourage everyone, I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes to, uh, take a look at primary vision network. Uh, again, it's subscribe and, and just, you know, kind of keep help keep your finger on the pulse of, of what's going on in energy markets and economics in general. Um, Mark, do you, do you have any closing last words or any thoughts or, uh, you know, especially around, you know, now that you're this content creator, I mean, would you advocate for people to, to get out there and spread their message or, or, you know, what, what do you think on that side of things? I, I think, I think it is, especially down based on, you know, especially how this, this listener base is, is bent towards the energy side. I think we have to get a bit more vocal and, and not so much aggressive, but vocal on the benefits of what we're doing. Because even as the economy slows and we come into whatever recession is going to, we're going to be short energy still. And, and I think even as, and, and, uh, and when you look at supply demand, it's like, well, supply is still low. So demand has to come down, but how low does demand have to go to get to that equilibrium and I think we're going to get a very interesting dynamic similar to the 70s and early 80s, where even as you come into a recession, you're not getting the same impact on energy, which is going to be great for the listeners. And I think it's it comes down to a point of, look, we need to support what we're doing. Like we know, I mean, most people that are listening to this got into energy because they like being outdoors. You know, Nobody is going out there to purposely pollute. They're going out there to do a job that they believe in. And it addresses the needs of, I think, a, a growing society. And, and a lot of it is very green. A lot of it does meet a lot of the protocols that are, that are required and need to be the backup generation to solar and wind. And, and I right. think we need to find a way to work together as a basket approach and not a one or the other. It's like, guys, why can't it be everything? Let's look at geology. You know, yeah. can, can I build a coal facility pop on a fuel, uh, uh, a couple of fuel, uh, flu gas captures and turn around and throw off a ton of, of food grade carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen. If I, if I take some of the steam, you know, is there a way that I can increase my natural gas consumption? And, and, but you know, if you're in the plains of Nevada, solar is great. You know, if, if you're in the winds of the Northeast, you know, wind is great, but it's just a matter of working together and not hating on one or the other. And just accept the fact that, it's a basket approach. It's always going right. to be a basket approach and it's not a bridge fuel. And I think that is what I, we need to really ride home and show the importance of natural gas, NGLs, and what the U.S. energy sector can, uh, can, can really generate. Yeah, no, that's, that's, and, and again, for, for the listeners, and I've preached this a bunch, is it's, I'm, I'm certainly an advocate for all of the above approach, but I think while a lot of the goals and initiatives 
you know, clearly they make sense. The intent is pure. Um, but at the end of the day, markets and consumers want cheap and reliable energy. And so I think it's one thing to keep in mind. That's, you know, that's the truth. And anytime there's economic growth, there's always, it creates that demand for energy. And so how do we get there while making sure that everyone has heat, uh, you know, everyone can eat. Um, there's enough fertilizer out there to keep growing all this food that we keep just, you know, gorging down our throats, especially here in America. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just, it's just to, to again, approach it. In a, and then like we talked about earlier, Mark, is do your own research. And, um, you know, while I think a lot of these energy technologies are great, it's understanding the entire life cycle of how these things actually get deployed and how they, how much of an energy input uh, you know, is required to to get the output of energy. Um, and so when you kind of go down the value chain, there's some things that we need to clean up, but oil and gas isn't perfect and nor is any other industry out there. And so right. I think it's about educating everybody and and doing it in a kind, respectful and non-divisive way, I think is what's going to move the needle. So, uh, but again, Mark, really appreciate your time. And before we log off, I just want to remind the listeners that I'm currently opening opening up sponsorship opportunities for the podcast. If any energy focused companies are looking to increase their brand marketing initiatives, visibility and awareness around their company's initiatives uh, through the podcast, please reach out. I'd love to work for you or sorry, work with you. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, appreciate all everyone's time. Mark, thanks again. And uh, what I'll do is I'll put all the links in the show notes for, uh, for, you know, your, your LinkedIn and the, the podcast, the website, um, any other uh, links that you'd like me to include? I, I can, I can send you the one for C6, just so you have an idea of uh, you know, yeah. the, the full gambit of things that we're, uh, we're trying to accomplish. Excellent. Well, listeners, please subscribe, leave a review, and always remember everyone deserves access to energy and we is greater than me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.